so I think that what we're going to do is again play a bad opening uh, with either color and then try to spend some time recovering from it. But I'm not going to blunder a piece. I'm just going to play a bad line or a bad opening. And then I'm going to try to recover from it. Maybe a bond cloud. I don't know. That's actually not a bad idea. I mean, it's not just a troll. It would be a good way for me to talk about king safety and how to improve king safety. Let's do that seriously. Let's play a bond cloud. But let's play it in a serious way where we I then try to explain how I recover from it. In fairness, in, in my defense, um, disclaimer, I haven't played it before and I might end up getting crushed, but I don't think I will. Okay, Von Cloud speedrun, here we go. 10 minute game, 1432. We're assuming that he plays e4. I mean, no, which of course he does. And I guess he'll play a Bon Cloud on the other side, d4, d5, and then king d7. Okay, let's play queen's gamma decline, and then let's play king e7. Pretend it's a mouse slip. All right, there we go. Now, it, uh, this version of the Bon Cloud honestly is, even, is not even that bad because the Queen's Gambit is not the most aggressive opening. But nonetheless, now we can't castle and we have a king on e7. So, okay, so what's going to be the, the first step to recovery? Well, we don't necessarily need to bring the king back to e8 immediately, but we will need to do that at some point. The ideal scenario here is for us to castle by hand. Um, so let's begin by, com com by trying to complete our development, knight f6. And at this point, I think it's a good idea to drop the king back to e8. That's one approach. Um, the other approach is to Fianchetto the bishop and then try to castle by hand, go rook e8, bishop f8. The problem with Fianchettoing is that he's got this move b3, and then the bishop can come out to a3 and prevent us from running the king back to f8. So we can rely on the fact that he won't see it, which is one possibility. And probably that's what we're going to end up doing. I mean, king e8 is the other possibility, but let's go g6. If he goes b3, we'll just go bishop g7. And in response to bishop a3, we'll just drop the king back to e8. Okay, so let's be in Keto. And we are only two steps away from castling by hand. Yes, f4. So obviously we shouldn't go rook f8 because that would block the king's passage to f8. We should go rook e8, and the first step has been completed. We have gotten our king to safety on f8, and I would even bring the king all the way to g8. Oh, 15 bucks from Lazy. Thank you. Okay, now step two. Of course, we've spent all these tempi. Now we need to actually do stuff in the center and complete our development. So this entire construction is pretty flimsy, and we need to somehow break it down. Right, That construction is flimsy, but if we don't do anything to it, white's going to have total positional domination over the position. So what should we do? How should we go about it? And we had this in the last speedrun. We had this particular move in the last speedrun. Yeah, c5. Let's just break down white's center as quickly as we can because he's getting stuff done on the king side. We don't have time to waste. Let's go c5. Yeah, but h5 is not dangerous. The thing to understand about h5 is because we have this construction, this is actually very solid. Th this is very, very solid. And there's no threat. h takes g6. We just play h takes g6. So we should begin by taking on d4. And then the question to you guys is, should we take on c4? Is that a good idea or not? Is it is it a good idea to trade one more time on c4? And again, I always catch you guys on this question. I ask a question like this, and because you're used to saying no, because most uh, most of the time that the, these kinds of questions are asked, the answer is no. That's how I get you. The answer is yes. Uh, we should absolutely take on c4. Well, why should we take on c4? Well, I mentioned that it's a good idea to open the center here. If you look at the position after dc, white is left with an isolated queen pawn on d4. We are now uh, pressuring that pawn with our queen, which is the best of all worlds. And uh, there's just no downside to the move D takes C4. That's why we played C5. We're trying to open up the center uh, in order to, by busting open the center, we're going to make it a lot harder for White to focus his attention on the king side, if that makes sense. For instance, the queen 
is now tied down to the D4 pawn. Okay, now we need to continue our development. And in particular, we need to develop the knight on b8. Well, where should we go with it? There's actually two approaches we could take. The first approach is to go knight b to d7, and then knight b6 and knight d5, blockading the square in front of the IQP. But I would prefer a more direct approach. I think we should try to get rid of this knight as quickly as possible. And I think we should just go knight c6. Uh, the move b6 is bad because of queen f3, I think. Okay, knight e2. Knight e2, what should we do now? Well, now we can, for instance, we can blockade the pawn on knight d5. Um, but ideally, we would want... Yeah, we do want to fianchetto this bishop. We want to play b6 and bishop b7, but we can't do that because the knight is going to hang. So how can we prepare the move b6? Well, you might ask yourself, well, what do you need to do in order to prepare b6? Well, you need to, de you need to defend this knight. What can you defend it with? Well, if you defend it with a bishop, that defeats the purpose. We're trying to put the bishop on the long diagonal. You can defend it with a queen. But where should you defend it from? Well, you should defend it from a square such that the queen maintains its pressure on d4. That's why I don't like queen c7. And that's why I like the square queen d6. No, not queen b6 because that blocks the b pawn. So by process of elimination, we come up with this move. Okay, so that's actually amazingly that he played queen d3 because he is stopping b6 because of knight takes c6 and bishop b5. So what we should probably do is go knight b4 and chase that queen away. And then we can play b6. Thank you, Zeus Fortuna. Does that make sense? We go knight b4, and then we're going to try to play b6. Okay, this guy is pretty good, I have to say. He's, he's not folding over and dying. Okay, so he's contemplating where to put his queen. Do you guys see why b6 doesn't work here? Did I explain that properly? Why does b6 not work? Because he trades on c6, and then he has bishop b5 pinning the queen to the rook. That's why queen d3 is good, because the b5 square was previously unprotected. And that's why we play knight b4. We just get the knight away from there so that we can play. Okay, queen f3, another excellent move. So again, you have to be stubborn with your ideas. b6 blunders the rook. Therefore, you play rook b8. And now, in addition to b6, you might even consider going b5, if possible, with tempo, attacking the bishop. Uh, not just automatically playing b6. Yeah, knight c2 was possible, but taking this pawn on d4 is, a, is, is quite dangerous. It opens up the center. And with our position being as cramped as it is, opening up the center completely, I think, favors white. Which is kind of a weird thing to say. It's a good thing for us to keep this pawn alive, if that makes sense. By keeping this pawn alive, we're keeping the d-file closed, which is not allowing white to, to really pressure us in the center. So I'll explain after the game, but knight c2, knight takes d4 is not a free pawn. It looks like a free pawn, but it gives white a huge initiative. Trust me. I'll explain after the game. And this is where, you know, your understanding hopefully will be advanced. Okay. Now, as explained, rather than just going b6 passively, let's go b5 and, and do the same thing with a gain of tempo. Should be 7. And now we got all our pieces out, which is great. We still have this pesky knight on e5 to deal with, but that's okay. We can work around it. That knight's not the end of the world. The knight's honestly not the end of the world. If he ever goes a3, we can drop our knight back to d5. We have an excellent blockading square uh, in front of the isolated queen pawn, which I've explained many, many times. This is the ideal square. Okay. So we should just continue making active moves here. There's no, like, way to play this type of position, right? You just look at your pieces. You see what can be improved. So for instance, I look at this knight on f6, and I see that it can jump out to e4. Well, that, that looks like a pretty active move, right? Knight e4 looks like, a, looks like a good way to improve our position. So these positions, don't overthink them. a5, a4 is another excellent idea here, by the way. Try to get this bishop off of b3. Rook, well, not rook e c8. I would play rook b c8. I actually think this rook on e8 is pretty valuable. It's protecting the e6 pawn. So it's it's really discouraging knight takes f7 shenanigans. So play reasonably. And don't, 
you know, always think that there's there's some algorithm to finding the best move. Sometimes it's just like, okay, I'm going to look around the board and I'm going to improve the position of my pieces. That's it. That's really it. His position is good. He's played very, very well so far. Okay, queen g4. Let's continue improving the position of our pieces. Well, now I'm looking at the knight on b4. I think the time has come for us. You know, one thing I see about the move queen g4 is that it, it does... Uh, cause the bishop to be undefended. Which means that what move now is a little bit more enticing than it previously was? Well, that's the move knight back to d5 because it actually hits the bishop. Does that make sense? Okay, good. I'm a little bit worried about the move rook f3. That, is, that would be a very good move. Okay, he takes it. What should we take back with? Yeah, we should take back with the queen to prepare the battery. Absolutely. Let's prepare the battery. Now, you might look at this and say, well, wait a minute. I don't get it. What are you talking about? Isn't the queen defending g2? But this is what chess is all about. You're playing the short-term game, but you're also playing the long-term game. What if the queen leaves g4 at some point? What if he goes queen h4? You never know how the circumstances might change. And so, you know, there's no downside to taking with the queen. You're just building up a battery for the future. And you might also go a move, you might also play a move like knight f6. Okay, he goes rook, eight, rook f3. Now we should continue improving our position. Now we should continue improving our position. Now, knight f6 is possible, but I don't really see the point of it because we're not attacking the rook. What can we do to improve our position? Well, look around. Which pieces can be improved? Which pieces can be activated? Absolutely. We can play rook bc8 and try to infiltrate c2 with our rook. Now, am I worried about the rook lift? No, because here's the thing. Even if the queen appears on h7, after king f8, white's going to have a hard time finding a follow-up. That's a good thing I call the best and worst case scenario test. Like if your opponent has an idea and you think that idea is scary and you're not sure, ask yourself, what happens if I let my opponent fully accomplish his idea, his or her idea? And you do that and say, okay, well, what if I goes queen h4? And then queen h7 check. Well, how scary is that in reality? It's not. You just go king f8. Oop, my headphones died. Okay, so now we can continue activating with rook c2. And at this point, what I want you to notice is that the queen is overloaded. What is black threatening in this position? What is black threatening in this position? Look carefully. Knight f6. Knight f6 is right. Why is knight f6 a threat? Because the queen is overloaded. It's guarding g2 and it's guarding the knight. And it can't do both at the same time if you play knight f6. So knight f6, queen f3, you will take the queen and then the knight on e2 will be hanging. Knight takes g6. Okay, this looks like desperation to me. Um, now let's be accurate. Don't automatically grab the knight on g6. If you grab the knight, he takes queen takes g6. You can kind of see what he's trying to do. We have a much better move than f takes g6. What move is that? Yeah, we can play knight f6. We can still play knight f6. There's no reason not to. This is a paper tiger. It looks dangerous, but in reality, it doesn't actually produce anything. There's no threat associated with that knight. Once we take the knight on e2, we will be threatening to take on g2 with absolutely devastating effect. In fact, rook h8, bishop takes h8. And if knight e7 check, there's king f8. I did see that. Good catch, but it, it doesn't work. Yeah, rook h8 check is a common pattern. If we had a rook on f8, well, I guess then knight e7 would be checkmate. But rook h8 check has to be considered. Rook h8 has to be considered. But then we play bishop takes h8. If the knight moves anywhere but e7, then we will be able to take the queen. And after knight e7 check, we just move the king to f8. And then if he takes his, our queen, then we take his queen with our knight. Does that line make sense? I hope you can follow that line in your mind. Rook h8, bishop h8, knight e7, king f8. And then he can take our queen, but then we will take his queen. Just And, and don't be afraid of trying to visualize. Like Everybody can try to visualize lines, and that helps you... With calculation like as i'm saying these lines really try to make those moves in your mind 
but it doesn't matter. I'm up. Remember that I, I'm essentially up a piece already. And I will, I, sorry, I will be up a piece once the next move happens. And Rook H8 check gives up a Rook. So I don't really care about pawns at the end of the line. Yeah, he might flag. I mean, White's position is lost. He starts to lose all of his pieces here. Okay. This is collapsed. Knight C3. Now, it's easy to get overwhelmed in a position like this, but you should break this down into its component pieces. So one option is to take the queen. And then once he takes our queen, we can just take the knight and we'll be up a piece. But there is a much better move here. Yeah, the, the better move is rook takes g2 check. That, that was ultimately our idea. If queen takes g2, then this is mate. Okay. And if he had gone king f1, well, what's the fastest win? Well, as I always talk about, when there's two queens and they're hanging, the first thing you should look at is whether you can move your queen away with check. Can you move your queen away with check? You can. Queen c4 check, that actually wins the queen. If you queen e2, you can take the queen. A simple game. Um, it's. I mean, I, I don't feel like I really spent a lot of time in recovery. So the, Because really, what we did, and the, you know, I played very straightforwardly, we just castled by hand. And I got a little bit fortunate. I think even here, the move b3 would be very nasty. Because the bishop comes out to a3. And if we go rook e8, you actually just lose your queen. So you're, you know, you're not in time. And here we would have probably gone like knight bd7, bishop a3, and then walked back to e8. So once we got our king to f8 and then g8, okay, we have a position down a bunch of tempi, but it's still fine. And notice what we did here. We go c5 immediately, just contesting his center. Then we trade everything. And we go knight c6. We pound at the center. And around here, I think white is still doing well. Here, he should have gone bishop e3. Knight e2 is passive. Queen d3 is a very nice move. Rook b8, bishop e3, b5. Now, already at this point, I think white is worse. But here, he started going really wrong. I think maybe even the move f5 can be considered with white here. And um, white has some sort of attack i guess yeah this looks interesting well f5 if you play e takes f5 you give up f7 how would white prevent manual castling well that's that's what i indicated with b3 the way to prevent manual castling in this specific position is is really even here to play the move b3 and then develop hyperphy and keto the bishop to a3 and do you see that that prevents the king from walking over to f8 and g8 in every position, there is its own way to deal with like a bond cloud type structure. So if you consider a traditional bond cloud here, it's like you don't even need to work as hard to get to the king. Like one of the best ways to play against the traditional bond cloud is, of course, to just rip open the center ASAP. And the real battle revolves around whether Y is able to castle my hand, if that makes sense. Yeah, so that was a decent game. We'll do more of this. And, you know, I think it'll be more interesting when we get to, like, 18, 1900, and I do something like this. That'll be, you know, really, there'll be a lot of meat on the bone there because, you know, these players are going to actually be very good at punishing me. So you have a lot to look forward to. I'm going to do some interesting stuff as we ascend further down the road in our third speed run. Hope you guys have been enjoying it. I hope it's not getting too repetitive. I, every speed run I finish, I say it's going to be the last, and then I start another one, but... Um, so far it's been, it's been going well, so I'm going to keep this going as long as people find it beneficial. I feel like there's always going to be st new stuff to talk about. It's not like I'm going to exhaust topics and, uh, yeah, thanks everybody for, for the support. Thank you for all the messages of improvement and really, um, it really means a lot when, when I see the impact that this has truly, and I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much. Bye everybody.